Hello, welcome to hashtag Climate Inquiry. I believe we are live. Um, welcome to the first part of our two part series, taking a deep dive into the effects of climate change on our natural wildlife, our natural habitats um, in two parts, like I said. So this is the first part. Thank you to everyone who is joining us so far. Um, you should see there is a comment section below this video. So please do feel free to use that, um, ask as many questions as you can. Um, get your thoughts across that is your opportunity to do so. Um, I'm Anna, I'm here in Slapton Lee Field Centre on behalf of the Field Studies Council, um, but this video, this initiative is also supported by the British Ecological Society. Um, so down here in Slapton Lee, we are on a beautiful barrier beach, so we're going to be having a little look about the effects of climate change on our barrier beach environment, our coastal environment, um, but as well we're going to be taking a look, a wider look, at um, the effects of climate change elsewhere in the UK. So wherever you are in the world, um, do let us know in the comments and we will have a look at kind of what's going on in your area as well. Um, if you have signed up for this video before, you should see a survey in your email inbox. So please do take a look at that um, before we get started or whilst this video is streaming. Um, it just allows us to see the kinds of people who are viewing it um, and what your kind of perceptions are of climate change at the moment and see how they develop um, throughout our recordings. Um, so please do that. If you have not signed up already, but you are just kind of viewing it on a whim, feel free to pass on this video to your friends as well. We want to make it reach as many people as possible. Um, so you can share it now whilst we're live, um, or you can kind of see it a bit later and share it and save it around then. Um, so without further ado, we're going to get started on our first um, section of content and we've entitled this whole episode as it were um, what is going on so we're going to be discussing what is going on with climate change um, and how can we better understand it and monitor it so like I said I am here in Slapton Lee and we're going to look at the effects of climate change on the coasts so we've got a brilliant video from our fellow tutor John he went down to the shingle ridge when it was a little bit colder earlier in the year um, and had a little investigation on the effects of climate change down there. So over to you, John. Hi, my name is John Reed. I work at Slapton Lee Field Study Centre, and I'm here to talk to you today about the effect of climate change on our local environment. Uh, habitat. It is a national nature reserve. 
Also a threat from the rising sea levels. <laughs> Sutton Lee provides a unique environment for plenty of waterfowl. As you can see, I'm here with some mallards and gulls, there are cormorants, more hens and peas. There are also otters on this lake and other very interesting species. Tor Cross on the southern end of Slapson Sands, which you can see stretching out behind me. You can see uh, the road that runs along and also uh, Slapson Lee. Slapson Lee is a National Nature Reserve and a triple SI, creating a, a wonderful habitat for a variety of different creatures. <laughs> This area has been hit by many storms over the years. The last big one to hit was in 2018, Storm Emma, that reached the ridge and caused two and a half million pounds worth of damage in the local vicinity. As well as being really an important home for wildlife, Slapton Lee presents an incredible environment for a variety of different plants. It is the only part of the country where you can find a plant called Stratwort, a small a flowering plant that is found on the edge of the Lee. It's too early in the year to see it at the moment, but during the summer it's flowering and it's only found here. <laughs> This pristine environment is under threat from rising sea levels. At some time in the near future, the sea will breach the ridge and this freshwater environment will change drastically into a saline saltwater environment, potentially a salt marsh. When the sea breaches, access on the road that you can see behind me will be cut off, cutting off Dartmouth and Kingsbridge, two of the lo uh, local larger towns. Ecologically wise, there is going to be a massive change. Not all for the worst. The freshwater species here, including the stratwort, will go. But if it turns into a salt marsh, there is a chance that the biodiversity will increase as the salt marsh will provide a different habitat for different species to potentially thrive. I didn't know it was possible to wear that many layers, but thank you, John. Um, that was a really brilliant, informative video um, from our very own Slapton Lee and Barrier Beach. Um, I also really liked that video. I feel like it showcased what we as a Field Studies Council offer as well. Uh, John is a brilliant tutor um, out on the Shingle Ridge showing exactly the real world, world effects of climate change on the wildlife, those mallards that we saw, the beautiful swans, the stratwort, um, all of these really important species to protect. Um, so thank you, John, for sharing that. Um, so we know that climate change is a really, you know, drastic, drastic effects happening every day to day and affecting the communities which are in these coastal environments. However, what about the longer timescales and actually how do we know that this is happening? Where's the evidence? Where's it coming from? 
Well, fortunately for us, we have a professional, a expert joining us um, today live from Zoom. Um, this is Malcolm Hart. He is a paleontologist and geoscientist from the University of Plymouth, and he's here to answer some of our burning questions. So hello, Malcolm. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for letting me be involved. Oh, not at all. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, again, a reminder to everyone watching, if you do have any comments for Malcolm or any questions, and please do pop them in the <clears throat> um, below comments section and we will get on to asking him um, what's on your mind. But should we start with some of the bigger, um, I guess, misconceptions about climate change? Let's start with them. Um, we heard a little bit of speak about from John about uh, sea level rise and the effects of global warming on our coastal environments. And we know in the media about the 2023 bringing, bringing the warmest year on record. So how do we know that that is down to climate change? And what about these weather fluctuations? How do we know that that is climate change talking? Well, th this is one of the difficulties. And uh, every time we see a particular weather event, um, usually it's either a forest fire or a heavy rainstorm. Um, people immediately think, is that climate change? And it's actually very difficult to prove a link with the weather as we experience it on human timescales with changes in the climate. And I think uh, you mentioned that 2022 was the warmest year on record. That's only because in Britain, we have the central England weather records or temperature scale that goes right back to the 1600s. And so when we take that time perspective, we can estimate, you know, how much is it a long-term feature? Is it a trend? And that, of course, relies on modeling rather than um, some scientific data. But where does 2022 fit in? Well, of course, uh, it was interesting that most climate scientists believe that that peak temperature of 40.3 degrees centigrade could not have happened in the UK if there had not been a change in our long-term climate. In other words, as the COP meetings, uh, COP26 in Glasgow and 27 this year in Egypt, as they're showing that the Earth is now an average of 1.1 or 1.2 degrees centigrade warmer globally, not just in any locations, um, it was that increase in global temperature changing the climate that let us have that unique weather event uh, last summer when we broke the 40 degrees centigrade barrier. So as a geologist, I take a long-term view, probably longer than most people, at looking at how things have changed over uh, thousands, if not millions of years. And that gives you a very different perspective on changes in climate, how fast they're occurring. And this knowledge allows us to say that the present changes are happening at rates that we do not see in the recent or even long distant geological record. And right. it's that rate of change that is the most significant thing for people to get their head around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that's really interesting. Brilliant. And hearing about what John had to say about how that directly impacts on increased storm events and sea level rise, could you maybe clarify that a little bit and how that links up to so the increasing temperature, increasing CO2? How does that directly lead to these storm events, these sea level rise changes? Well, in if you increase the atmospheric temperature, the air can hold more moisture as water vapor. So of course, that builds in the situation where in a storm event, 
which we get all the time, um, the amount of rainfall can be much greater because the atmosphere is carrying more water vapor and more moisture. But of course, the temperature of that atmosphere is directly controlling the rate of melting ice. Now, in sea level is controlled by uh, several things. One can be the shape of the ocean basins, but those changes happen on a millions of year time scale. You know, change the shape of the Atlantic Ocean it is not something we see happening quickly. If you melt ice, and of course, this is the concern that we are melting the Greenland ice cap, we're melting the Antarctic ice cap, and everyone from mountain areas like Switzerland or France uh, or Norway are reporting glacier retreat at a very fast rate. All that meltwater is getting into the oceans and that creates sea level rise. Now, calculating how much sea level rise takes place is quite difficult because if you melt the Arctic Ocean ice, well, actually, it doesn't have much of an effect because that ice is floating in the Arctic Ocean and already displacing water. So you only have to use terrestrial ice to calculate sea level rise. And of course, it, it's really quite a tricky operation to measure that rate of increase in sea level. But one thing we know, and, and going back to Slapton Barrier Beach, if you go down to the beach and look at the pebbles on that beach, virtually none of them, less than 1% of those pebbles, are from the local rocks. They're not dropping out the cliff, they're not being washed out the cliff. What is on that beach is material swept up from the floor of the English Channel as sea level rose over the last 18,000 years following the last glacial maximum. Remember, 20,000 years ago, you could have walked from Slapton across to Brittany. There was no water in the English Channel. And so as the ice melted and the ice sheet retreated, sea level rose. And all the gravel and pebbles on the floor of the English Channel, or what was to become the English Channel, was swept up onto uh, Slapton Beach or onto Chesil Beach or on many other features along the coastline of the United Kingdom. And that means that if you increase sea level, sea level rises, that beach will move because it's already been moving for the last 20,000 years. And of course, storminess, if we have these events that are caused by the increased moisture in the atmosphere, a more turbulent dynamic weather system, that creates sudden instability for that shingle beach. And we've had one or two very well-known storm events which have closed the road, battered Torcross, mm -hmm. and they're completely understandable on a long-term process. But we're getting used to the fact that one in 200 year events are now one in 100 or one in 50 or one in 20 year events because of the more dynamic weather systems that we are getting yeah yeah no it's really interesting actually we do still see the impacts of these storm events down in slapton quite frequently you can find chunks of road actually down on the beach it's quite incredible um so yeah definitely thank you very much for making that link super clear we have actually had a question come in live um and it is as well as how might a changing climate impact food security and food supply across the globe 
Well, weather's already doing that. I mean, um, this is not my field of agriculture, but when we look at patterns of climate change around the world, um, there are major events taking place, droughts on many year cycles. We're seeing changes in rainfall patterns. We're seeing um, as a result of weather events, although I must admit when I read through the literature on many of the fires uh, that we talk about, the wildfires, um, yes, some are wildfires, but a, a horrible number of these fires that we report in the media are actually deliberate, set by people. Um, that just doesn't help. But the climatic changes that we're seeing, um, yes, that is going to impact on the amount of rainfall, the amount of water. And of course, the trouble is, if you have a sudden moisture event, rainfall, storm event, following periods of drought, what happens very often is that that surface soil layer which is so critical to agriculture, just gets washed off because the ground uh, is suddenly hit with dryness underneath, a fluid, a lot of it um, happened in New Zealand just last weekend, um, a sudden event. And, and we all know this because if you drive around South Devon or anywhere else in the British Isles during a storm event, you will see little muddy rivers coming out of fields. And that's it on a smaller scale, but we know the process. And so, yes, climate change is going to impact on agriculture. The other thing, of course, is that much of the agriculture and the people who depend on it are in the coastal zone. And if sea level went up by one, two, three meters, that coastal zone will be very much impacted. And one of the quite disastrous side effects of that is that if salt water, if sea level rises and salt water gets into the groundwater that people use for their irrigation, then you can't use it because it's saline. And groundwater penetration by saline waters near the coast is a disaster waiting to happen. And, and we know that this is a problem. And it's probably going to be getting worse as uh, time goes by, and particularly if sea level goes up by the predicted amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, definitely that's a really prime example of actually yes our coastal communities are depending on on agriculture quite heavily but also it's impacting the rest of the uk a lot as well and, and and globally obviously um on that note we've mentioned a bit about coastal environments and obviously that is a focus with today's lesson um but how do you see sea level rise impacting those inner areas of the uk the ones which aren't so vulnerable to um, these storm events and retreating coastlines yeah it's uh... It's terribly tempting for people to say, oh, well, if you if if sea level goes up by maybe, I don't know, three, four, five, six metres, um, it will impact on the coast and the rest of the country will um, not notice it. But let's be honest, features like the Thames barrier, which protects London from flooding, it needs replacing. It had a design life to 2030. And we're not far from 2030. Now, if you think of the British economy, no matter where you live, if London was impacted by a major flooding event, the ripple effect of the damage to the British economy would affect everybody, whether they live on the top of a hill way away from the sea or not. So 
we have to think of the impact of coastal communities on the wealth of the nation and on the supply chains that operate around that nation. So, yes, people on high ground might be um, immune to flooding, but they're not immune to the effects that would be a knock on from it. Yeah, really good point. Really good point. Um, yeah, I mean, really insightful conversation. I wish you would carry it on even longer. Um, but unfortunately, we are going to have to kind of round it up there. We will keep Malcolm um, here to answer any more questions which come in. Um, and certainly we can we can post them to you in the following session as well or get your feedback on that. So do keep um, your input coming in, in the comments. Um, but thank you very much for that really interesting discussion. And quite clearly, um, it, climate change is a matter which will affect us all regardless of if we are on the coast um, or further inland. Um, so thank you, Malcolm, for your hard work and your dedication throughout your career on monitoring this. Clearly, it's not an easy task, um, and there are a lot of really brilliant researchers in this field as well. So it is worth looking at some of their research um, in your own time if you're interested in that as well. Um, so th this monitoring is clearly very complex and very inspirational. Um, and it's important that we use things like geology, as Malcolm mentioned, to monitor the effects of climate change or the impact on climate change um, over years, over geological timescales. Um, but what about the wildlife and the communities which are being affected by it? This is also a really huge task which needs monitoring. And actually, this is where the Field Studies Council and viewers like you come in. So projects such as citizen science projects, um, the willingness of the general public um, is really powerful when it comes to monitoring our wildlife communities. Um, so Fortunately, um, our team at Preston Montford have done a really brilliant job at doing exactly that and monitoring some of the local wildlife that surround them and seeing how that might be affected by climate change. So um, I'm going to pass you over now to Anna and Alex from Preston Montford Field Study Centre, um, who should be able to explain a little bit more about the work they do in monitoring um, moth populations. And today we'll be discussing and demonstrating how we monitor moths at Preston Montford. Okay, so this is where we set up our moth trap. Um, it's in between our Arco and Recon building. Um, it's just on the fringe of a woodland, an ancient woodland over there. And we have the rest of our site over this way. So it's a good habitat for moths. Um, and we can also gain access to electricity from inside the building as well for the light. This is a Skinner's moth trap, a non-lethal trap for macro moths used to record species ID and monitor species phenology and diversity. Here at Preston Montford, we set the trap up about once a week for recording and monitoring purposes and input this data into iRecord and our personal data system. To set up the moth trap, we must assemble the parts, slotting them into place like you can see us doing here. Okay, so now we're going to put some egg boxes into our moth trap. This is to make sure the moths are cozy and warm, that they have somewhere they can feel safe, where they can hide. We don't have to put food in the moth box because most adult moths don't need to feed, and some that do feed will only have boxes of liquids like nectar. So now Anna's putting the perfect slides in create a funnel for the moths to fall into the box. Okay, so you see we have some plastic bags on the battery and on the uh, extension lead here. That's just to make sure if it rains overnight, which hopefully it shouldn't, um, that all the electricity is safe from the water um, and then we just pop the light on into these two slots and um, we're ready to turn it on. We'll be back tomorrow morning to see what we find inside. How does the moth trap work? 
Well, first we need to understand why moths are attracted to light. One theory is that most moths use the light of the moon to navigate, keeping themselves at a constant angle to the light. The light in the moth trap outshines the light of the moon, confusing the moth. The moth will then continuously circle the light, keeping it on one side of itself. When the moth hits the light, it will give it a slight shock, causing the moth to fall in. Good morning, we're here with our moth box and we're going to have a look to see what's inside. Since it's early February, we're not expecting to find that many moths because most moths don't overwinter as adults. Should we take a look? Yeah, so also we disassembled the light um, closest to the first sunlight um, and we put this uh, bed sheet over it just to make sure nothing flies away um, before we start trying to find some moths. Now we start removing the egg boxes one by one to carefully look for moths. We are picking the egg box up by the top and turning them over, checking all the crevices before being sure there are no specimens in there. So as we expected, we actually didn't catch anything overnight last night. Um, we usually do sample between mid-March um, to November, so we weren't expecting to get anything. Um, but if we were to find something, we have these insect pots, and this is where we will try and get the moths into. Uh, we use paint brushes as well. So if I was to have a moth on this bit of egg box, could you please hold that for me, Alex? We would open the pot and gently try to get the moth so, close the lid, not all the way, so there's still a bit of oxygen going through and then we can take that um, back to our office or outside of the building just to identify the moths. There are so many amazing moths that live around us. To start identifying moth species, it can help to describe one characteristic at a time. Firstly, let's look at the shape. Moths sit in different ways and fold their wings differently. This can be a really good place to get started on identifying our moths. Then, we can start to describe the colour and patterns. This moth is mostly green and we can notice two cross lines on the forewings and one on its hind wing. This moth is mostly blue and you can see it has a checkered wing fringe. Can you spot any other identifiable characteristics about this moth? Then we can see this moth has a bold yellow stripe but was mostly grey. By the way it's sitting, we can see that its forewings are tucked tightly in. If this moth were to take flight, we would see distinctive straw-coloured hind wings as it is based on a common footman moth. Colourful hind wings or underwings can be very useful in identifying moths, so make sure to take note if you get the chance. What you might first notice about this moth are the orange spots on the bottom of the wing. They're very distinctive and colourful. These spots are often referred to as kidney spots and can be really useful for identification. They can be different colours and shapes depending on the different species. Some species have many markings. The spots above kidney spots are called oval spots. Sometimes the markings are fainter and harder to see, so you will have to look close for them. Now, shall we have a go and identify a moth ourselves? Are you ready to take some notes? Okay, let's get started. So we can see our moth. It's a brownie, groundy colour, and we've got the bright orange kidney spots on the forewing. From its shape, we can identify it as probably being a noctuid, and we can see that there's an extra spot near its kidney spot. Now we've got our notes, let's try and have a go at identifying it. You can use the web or an ID book, 
or some of the really useful websites we've put in our references. So now we've gone over how to ID a moth or just the starts of it, we'll see how to put them into a database like iRecord. Over to Anna. iRecord is a widely used system for recording wildlife sightings to be used for scientific research. We have our own account here at Preston Montford, but you can use it without an account or with a personal one. So if you click on record, you can either enter a casual record or a list of records, add in a date that you set out the moth trap and enter your name. For the sake of this, we're just going to be putting Preston Mumford. Then enter the species that you found. And it will give a drop down of all of the species in iRecord system. Then enter your certainty of how certain you are of the species that you've identified. Add the quantity and the sex if you can. This is not really that possible for moths as you would need to dissect them under a microscope. But for any other species, you can add in the sex. And the stage of moths that you'll most likely catch in a moth trap are adults. You then add the identifier's name, which may be different to the recorder's name. And then you need to set a location. You can do this by clicking on the location in the map or entering a spatial reference. And here we can see our site and we can look for exactly where we put the moth trap and click on it with a 10 meter squared selected. Then you may want to put the habitat if you've just seen something in the wild or if you've caught it in a moth trap like we have, then we would just enter that we've caught it in a Skinner's moth trap and then we can submit. Now that we've got the chance to understand how to identify moths and record them, we can see what some of our data might show us. The Rothenstead Insect Survey and the State of Moth Report 2021 shows us that the abundance of moths has been declining steadily since the 1970s. Over the 50 year period, there's been a significant loss of 33% or a third of the abundance that we would have seen in the 1970s. There is no one clear reason for this decline. However, some factors are land use change, light pollution, chemical pollution, and habitat destruction. Climate change is considered to be one of the main drivers of changes in distribution due to rising average temperatures. But we don't know all the effects that climate change is having. The National Moth Recording Scheme showed us that whilst 37% of species increased in distribution, 32% decreased. So now we've had a brief overview of the wider trends in the UK, we can take a closer look at the trends that we have seen at PM. We have the Rothenstead Insect Survey Light Trap here at Preston Montford. Every day, one of the members of the staff goes out and collects the sample that has been taken and we post it to a identifier who will then identify the moths and use that data ex to extrapolate what moths might be here. Thank you to the Rothamsted Insect Survey for sharing this data with us. We are looking at the data for Preston Montford from their Trap of the Month report from 2020. So this graph shows us the total count of moths at PM from the 1970s to 2020. Uh, this includes um, micro moths as well as larger moths, which we've previously spoken about. Um, and we can also see that there's no significant trend here at PM, which is unusual compared to the national trend of decline that we see in the previous slides. So if we take a look at the individual species that we've recorded here at PM, we'll actually be able to see some trends, such as the yellow tail and the common footman, which have both significantly decreased in abundance since the 1970s. There are also species like the flame shoulder, the snout, and the green carpet, which have increased in abundance since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. 
One interesting change that's happened due to climate change is that multi-generational moths, being moths that can have multiple generations a year, are more likely to have multiple generations every year rather than every few years, uh, and this increases their abundance. Research has shown that multi-generational moths are more resilient to climate change than single-generational moths. The warming climate means that single-generation moths are emerging earlier and more likely to be affected by frost before getting to complete their life cycle and bring in the next generation. This could be one of the reasons why that we see some species increasing in abundance and other species decreasing, but it doesn't tell us the whole story. To find out why, scientists need more data from people like you to help input into their research. If you would like to investigate for yourself, we recommend the State of Larger Moths Record 2021, which is an amazing document um, collaborated by multiple organisations and resources to help provide information on the overall trends of moths in the UK. Also, please take a look at our references that we've provided alongside our video. Thank you for learning with us about how to trap, identify and record moths. If you love moths as much as we do, there are so many ways you can get involved and help. One of the ways is by creating moth friendly habitats or maintaining what you have already in your garden. This could just be leaving a patch to go wild or letting some nettles spring up. Whatever you want, it's easy to get started. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye. I'm just finishing up my notes on those moths. Amazing, thank you. Um, I'll be out tonight trying to find as many different colours as I can. Um, if you do want to get involved in that moth identification, the link to the website um, is in our description in the comments below. Um, so check that out as well. Just be aware though, that mystery moth does come in a variety of colours. So watch out for that when you're looking at the identification guides and it can catch you out a little bit. Um, just as that video was rolling, we did have a few more questions come in for Malcolm. Um, also, I can see where you're all watching from. So we've got um, Cumbria, the West Midlands, uh, Newbury, Newcastle University. Um, so hello to everyone watching across the UK. Um, that one extra question, well, we have a few extra questions, actually, but we're going to focus on this one for now. Um, worth noting, however, that we will be listing these questions that have come in. Um, we'll be submitting them to Malcolm after the video stream ends, and then he will get back to us with the questions, which will then um, be handed over to you. However, there's one question which actually sticks out quite a lot um, concerning what we can actually do as citizens, um, which links quite nicely into the work of Preston Montford. So the question is, for us concerned members of the public, what are the top things Malcolm thinks we as citizens could be doing? Well, I think the most important thing is to be aware mm. and think about what is going on. And in particular, think about where you get your information from. So, for example, you may read in the media or hear in the media or, or see social media links to organisations like the British Ecological Society, the Royal Society, the Geological Society, the Royal Geographical Society. If you see something that is being put out or a lecture being provided by organisations like that, I think it's up to the younger community to really go and listen, keep up to date, do not accept everything you're told without thinking. And in particular, be very careful because, I mean, I saw a headline in one of the tabloid newspapers about three weeks ago that we were about to get a massive snowstorm. Well, this was all about selling newspapers. There was no storm coming. Uh, so be aware that you can be hoodwinked. When it comes to doing things on the ground, think of the side effects. Planting trees will affect the carbon dioxide budget, but not for many years, and the impact will be relatively small. 
But the side effect in terms of ecosystems, in terms of wildlife management, the side effects of doing that will probably be more important than the actual carbon dioxide you're going to sequester. So think very carefully about not just the prime cause, but the secondary cause. If it impacts and helps the environment, then that's fine. Um, use that as, as a secondary guide. But my plea to people, particularly the younger generation, is keep informed, but be very selective about who and when you believe what you're being told. It's really quite difficult. And I keep reading things that I wish I could get rid of in terms of where their impact is. Um, I think they call that censorship, but it's that's the wrong word. But no, my, my main message is just get involved, get up to date, learn about your environment as to what's going on uh, and cherish it. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. That's really insightful. Um, yeah, I definitely think, you know, the age of social media is positive and it's negative. So definitely take that <clears> and <throat> um, go out, connect with your outdoors. And, and like Malcolm said, yeah, just be aware of what you're reading online. Brilliant. Um, we are actually going to have to say goodbye to Malcolm now. <laughs> so sorry, well, I'll keep the questions which you've sent in and we'll submit them to him. But thank you very much for that, Malcolm. That was really, okay. really Good insightful. Afternoon. Thank you. Um, moving on then slightly, but on that same note, again, going back to what Preston Montford was saying um, about the monitoring of species and the monitoring of our wildlife. How do we connect with it? How do we monitor it? And um, certainly we have a tutor who has gone out there and proven exactly that. So fortunately for us down in Devon, um, we are very uh, fortunate in that we get spring a little bit early and we're starting to see signs of spring already um, in February. Again, going back to what Malcolm said, connecting with the outdoors, connecting with um, these signs of spring, not necessarily of climate concern, um, but actually just to kind of get a sense of what's going on and allowing that to align with um, with what we might be seeing in the media um, to explain a lot better than I'm explaining right now Greg's been out there in Slapton to explain um, everything you need to know about looking out for the signs of spring so over to you Greg So welcome to Slapton our centre located on the south coast of Devon and in this video, we're going to be taking a little look at some signs of spring that you can keep an eye out for all over the country. Now, as winter is slowly starting to fade away, we are now getting these warmer, sunnier days. Coming up through the leaf litter from last year's uh, autumn, here are some of our daffodils. Now, these are generally the first signs of spring that you might notice. They're coming up and should be flowering in the next couple of weeks. Um, as the spring warms up, the spring actually spreads from south to the north roughly at walking pace. So we're going to be showing you a few things you can keep an eye out for in your local area. So we've come down to one of our classic Devon lanes down here. So on my right we've got some daffodils which have already emerged and they're already in full bloom. This is because this lane is providing a microclimate which is just slightly warmer than the surrounding countryside allowing these plants to develop just a little bit quicker than everywhere else. On my left hand side we've also got a beautiful hedgerow forming. Now this will also be coming into bloom with a variety of plants. We've got ivy in here and we've also got some hazel starting to appear in this hedgerow as well. Now as well as the daffodils starting to bloom we've also got this, tr this tree line which will also be emerging very shortly. So you can also keep an eye out for the, some tree catkins as well. Here at Slapton Lee we're down on the Shingle Ridge uh, just between Slapton Lee Lake and the sea and on this ridge we've got a variety of flowering plants which are just starting to open up now as the warm weather appears. So we've got a gorse bush next to us over here with its beautiful yellow flowers. So the gorse flowers will flower twice a year and they're vital in the spring for providing a nutrient source for emerging insects such as bumblebees. Now, you need, they will give off a very unique smell, almost like coconut, and in fact, the gorse flowers are even edible. 
although these ones might need a few more weeks. So we've come down to the reed bed area of Slapton Lee and this is the perfect place for amphibians to be emerging and starting to lay their spawn. So down here at the Lee we get both frog spawn and toad spawn and there's a couple of ways you can tell the differences. Now the frog spawn will be those familiar clumps that you might see in your ponds and your gardens and the toads will lay a big long string of spawn usually attached to these reed beds over here. Now the frogs and toads will actually return to the same body of water that they themselves were born in. So it's really important that we preserve these wetland habitats and preserve the breeding sites for these animals. Uh, now generally the frog spawn will appear a little bit later on in the spring, but down here in the south of Devon it can appear as early as February. So it's also really important to keep any long grass or any vegetation near the ponds extra long as that provides an excellent shelter for these animals as they're making their way down to their breeding sites. So now we're back here at the Slapton Lee Field Centre and we're just in time to see the emergence of our hazel catkins. Now these catkins are the male part of the flower and you usually start to see them between January and March down here in South Devon. Uh, now these will be containing the pollen which the plants will be using to pollinate and reproduce. So these hazel catkins are often known as lamb's tails because they do tend to appear around the same time as the lambing season. And the hazel itself was traditionally used to create lambing pens down here on the farms. Out here at the Slapton Lee National Nature Reserve, we also encourage the hazel to grow as it creates a fantastic habitat for ground flora um, and also very rare animals such as the hazel dormouse. with the spring you might also start thinking about some gardening work particularly mowing the lawn after the winter break. Now we normally recommend mowing the lawn in the first two weeks of April but what you need to consider is do you actually need to mow the entire lawn? It's sometimes good to leave patches of long grass such as this bank uh, for wildflowers to appear. It also provides an excellent habitat for frogs but also being careful not to go over any compost heaps where you might find hibernating hedgehogs. Now, as you're watching out for this lawn, as the weather starts to warm up, you might also notice the emergence of bumblebees. Now, the queen bees will start to emerge and you'll often see them zigzagging very low to the ground as they try and look for a suitable nesting site for the year. What they'll also be looking for is those early emerging flowers, such as the gorse and the hazel that we've already looked at. So do keep an eye out for these features and keep an eye out for those signs of spring. Thank you, Greg. That was a brilliant video, brilliant introduction to signs of spring and things that you should be looking out for wherever you are in the UK in the coming weeks. Um, on that note, if you would like to learn any more about the species and the signs that Greg explained in that video, um, do just go to our website. It is in the description below um, and have a look at some photographs. It might make it a little bit easier in your hunt for signs of spring. Um, also, whilst you are there, this is your opportunity to get involved with our hashtag climate inquiry. OK, so we've spoken a little bit about how citizen science projects helps us to contribute towards these databases and these trends and this monitoring. Really, really important. Um, but now is your turn to get involved. So we have our survey one, two, three ArcGIS recording for you to input. OK, so this is our call for your help. First thing you need to be doing once you go out, wherever you are in the country, you need to be logging exactly where it is. Okay, so we are going to be monitoring the signs of spring when and where they appear. So go to this um, site, sign in. Whereabouts are you in the country? If you have location settings on, that should be fairly easy. The next part, what is the date? It could have been yesterday, it could have been the day before you spotted it. And um, pop in the date so we know when these signs are appearing. Um, the next thing you need to do, the most important thing you need to do is what sign of spring have you spotted? So all of the options that you are seeing here um, are signs which Greg has quickly outlined for you, but there is, of course, more information on our website. Once you log that, that then goes to our system and we can see exactly what you've been spotting across the UK. 
So in the next series or the next session of the series, and um, we'll have a review at this and we'll have a little look about the kinds of signs of spring that you've been spotting. And hopefully it will allow us to see that walking pace that Greg discussed in that first video and see how it's spreading, how spring is spreading across the UK, which should be really brilliant. Again, it's also really interesting to see how the climate might be impacting on that trend. So it's a really important piece of information for us and for the British Ecological Society as well to have a look at. On that note as well, this isn't the only citizen science project that you can be getting involved with. In fact, the Woodland Trust has a really brilliant citizen science project you might have heard of already called Nature's Calendar. So I'd encourage everyone at the moment just to write a little note. Again, there is information in our description um, about a free webinar, which is available on Tuesday, the 7th of March at 7 p.m. This is an opportunity for you to get involved in yet another citizen science project. It's all about how we can record and how we can identify um, the world around us, the natural signs of spring or um, winter, autumn, whatever it might be, just kind of keeping this nature's calendar ticking along and it's dependent on citizens like you to get involved with. So do give that a go on 7th of March, the Tuesday at 7pm. Um, if you're more interested in hearing more about what we do at the Field Studies Council, we have a range of publications available for you to delve into in a little bit more detail, however much you like. Um, if you're really interested in just getting a surface understanding of some different forms of nature, um, we do some really lovely basic guides as well for you just to take out on your daily walk. Um, however, if you're interested in more specific, you can see in this in the picture um, that there is more available information for you. So you can really take your interest a little bit further and delve into those areas of research, um, some which Malcolm discussed some which John, um, John and Greg have discussed, as well as the amazing tutors at Preston Montford. Um, other than that, we'd really love it if you could continue getting involved with our work with the Field Studies Council and the British Ecological Society um, by tagging us in your social media as well. So if you tag hashtag climate inquiry, and we will be monitoring this hashtag throughout the next few weeks until the next session, um, and we'll be able to kind of see what you've been discussing, see the signs of spring that you've been spotting, um, and we'll do another roundup in the next session. Um, we are at Field Studies Council. If you are going to tag us on social media, um, we have specific centre sites as well. So if you are close to a centre, you can tag them as well, wherever it might be. If it's down here in Slapton Lee, if it's up in Preston Montford, um, we have a range of centres across the UK. So do see which is your nearest centre um, and see if there's anything that you can get involved with there as well. I do have the answer to the moth question as well. Um, so if you don't want to hear it, yeah, the closure is, um, John Roll, the answer is a satellite moth. So hopefully if you've been um, getting involved in that moth identification, you should have come up with a satellite moth. I know that the pictures can be slightly different. So apologies if you're thrown off by that and they come in a range of different colours. Um, so thank you, Preston Montford gang for providing that wonderful um, quiz. And yeah, the answer is satellite moth. So do keep an eye out for them when you're out on your twilight walk as well. Um, if you are part of the FSC youth newsletter, um, do keep an eye out for another email from us about where you can send your videos and your findings. Um, so that we can then present them in the next session as well. Remember that we want to get you guys involved as much as possible. So if you are part of the FSC um, Youth Newsletter, do, do look out in your inbox. Um, likewise, if you would like to get involved with that, I don't have to say it again, the link is in our um, description. So just click on that and there's a lot more information than I could possibly fit um, in this video. Um, for our next broadcast, we hope you enjoyed this one. I certainly did. Um, our next broadcast is on the 5th of April and it is also running at 4pm, so the same time that we did this one. Um, we're going to be interviewing yet another expert. We have a tutor, Alice, who is also based down here in Slapton Lee, and she will be interviewing our Field Studies Council um, President, Professor Tim Burt, who is also an expert in climate, all things climate. Um, but we're specifically going to be talking about nature based solutions. OK, so we spoke a little bit about how these trends can be monitored in this session. Now we're going to really getting into the, the crux of um, what we can do in terms of preserving our nature and 
the nature-based solutions to these climate issues that we've been discussing. Again, if you have any ideas about that, any thoughts, put them in the comments um, or send us an email as well or tag us or whatever it might be that you prefer to do. Um, and we will discuss that all in the next session. Um, so yeah, do get involved in those citizen science projects I have discussed with you. Get involved in looking for the signs of spring. Hashtag us, hashtag climate inquiry. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you again, Malcolm. Um, for answering some of our live questions.